group and uh, making their presence known. Why doesn't their bad experiences then correlate with your study? Um, I think that uh, because the, the people that have had good experiences don't bother joining such groups. We're not a group of malcontents. We're not a group of people who sort of get together and grind axes about doctors. There have been some good doctors. We give awards to doctors who do, you know, who are forward thinking and who do change things. There is a nucleus in the hypothalamus that is differently sized in male and females. Andy Hyder's story focuses attention on what can happen when chromosomes don't match gender identity. To better understand the biology of gender, scientists are researching another group on the gender extreme, transsexuals. They have the body to match their chromosomes, but believe their brain has been hardwired to go in the opposite direction. People since the dawn of, of, of humanity have, have wondered why we feel the sex we feel. And I think in these, uh, nature has kind of um, th thrown up um, these uh, variations uh, which are, are wonderful uh, and we should celebrate these um, these variations in, in gender identity. Why uh, should we celebrate them? Because I think it tells us uh, a lot about how we, how um, you and I um, perceive ourselves as the sex we are. Here in females it's about half the size. Transsexuals are particularly interesting to scientists who want to map out the pattern of human sexual development. They provide a unique sample that animal studies can't replicate. There is a small but growing body of evidence that transsexual brains are hardwired in utero to be either male or female. Professor Harley hopes to prove in his study that brain sex is responsible for the transsexual condition. I think there might be a public perception that, you know, transsexualism is a lifestyle choice and I think to, to reaffirm a biological basis w would be quite um, empowering for them. Professor Harley is researching a variance in the sequence of genes thought to be found in male to female transsexuals. He is studying the DNA of 50 people. His work may also help to explain why as males or females we behave the way we do. Well, I think ultimately um, it would be great to find gender identity genes and, and it might be through the studies of transsexuals that we'll get to those genes. Uh, in fact, I think it's the only way we're going to get to those genes. The theory of brain sex is not only challenging for science, but also for the law. It was relied on for the first time in Australia in a landmark case in the family court. Kevin, a transsexual, wanted to marry his partner, Jennifer. The Federal Attorney General's department opposed the marriage, arguing that Kevin, in the eyes of the law, was female. To be a man, Kevin must have been born with male chromosomes, genitals and gonads, but instead he was born into the body of a female. Why did you decide to get married? Well, I'm a bit of a traditionalist, first of all, and I really wanted to marry Jennifer. Um, but the absolute crunch of the matter was to provide security for her and any children we chose to have later. The family court forbids the identification of parties to its proceedings. For the purpose of the court case, the couple were known as Kevin and Jennifer. This is the first time they've ever spoken publicly. They have been disguised. I remember going to bed night after night, you know, wishing that when I wake up, that I'd be like all the other boys instead of being different. For as long as Kevin can remember, he perceived himself to be male. When he was very young, his mother tried to persuade him he was a girl. She had her husband and child stand naked in front of each other. I just continued to say, I'm a little boy, and she kept saying, you're not. And I think out of desperation, she eventually made me stand in front of my father who was naked and said to me, look, you don't look like your father. You're not a boy. And I said, but I am. Kevin was the oldest of four children. He had three sisters. His adolescence was traumatic. At school, he was harassed for wearing boys' clothes. He had to learn how to fight to protect himself. 
So kids used to tease me and you know, harass me constantly. You're a girl, you're not a boy. Why do you dress like that? Why do you look like that? Why do you play soccer and football and cricket? Why can't you be like the rest of us? And I just say, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. I can't be you. I'm being myself. Then puberty kicked in. He started to develop breasts and menstruate. Oh, it was dreadful. It was absolutely dreadful. You know, it was like my worst nightmare. How could this be happening? Some, something's wrong. You know, everyone kept telling me, you're a girl, you're a girl. And now my body's telling me I'm a girl and I'm not. Like, this is unbelievable. How could this be happening? Ten years ago, at 29, Kevin heard for the first time about gender reassignment surgery. Where would you be now if you hadn't had surgery? Oh, certainly not here. Certainly not here today. Certainly not having a life. Oh, without a doubt, I would be dead. I was getting to the point where it was becoming more and more difficult to get up out of bed every day and put on this facade. What would you say to people who say... Look, people like you should just get some therapy and be content in the body that you were born with. <laughs> That's the biggest joke of all. They have no understanding of the concept of transsexualism. They have no understanding of what it's like to have a mind that's not in sync with your body. They have no idea at all. And I said, you know, come and walk in my shoes for a day and see what it's like. Kevin started hormone treatment that led to hair growth on his face, chest and legs. Two years later, he had chest surgery followed by a hysterectomy. And what about when you found out about Kevin's history? Did that make any difference to you at all? No, except to say that it probably made me admire him more, certainly not less, because I could see what a huge... Um, what a huge journey he'd been on. I told her on our second date, and she was just incredible. S supportive, understanding, caring, and, well, history tells us. She chose to come along on the journey because of me, who I am, not about my gender. I had never had any... Um, any sense of him other than that he was completely male. His story about his transsexualism made no difference. Jennifer and Kevin started living together and not long after decided they wanted to start a family. Because Kevin was an infertile male, the couple applied to join an IVF program and used donor sperm. I do think it was significant that it was a public hospital clinic which accepted us onto their fertility program. We were the first such couple that they had accepted onto their program ever and so they needed to discuss the ethics of it. I think the green one should be in the middle because they're longer. After Jennifer conceived with their first child, the couple decided they should marry. Jennifer wrote to the Federal Attorney General asking if that was possible. We wrote more letters explaining thoroughly all about it. Um, the fact that my husband did have, well, had undergone uh, the process of transition. He'd taken all of the available medical steps. He'd made all of the social adjustments. He'd made the other legal changes in terms of documentation. He had a male birth certificate, a male passport, etc. And everybody, in every Everybody that, whose path he crossed regarded him as male, from the people closest to him, such as his partner, I might, you know, might say, um, our extended family, the people he worked with and anybody that passed him in the street, you know. <laughs> Jennifer and Kevin received an email back from an officer in the Federal Attorney General's department. It warned if they went ahead and got married, Kevin was liable for a penalty of up to two years' jail. The public servant also predicted if the couple took it to court, they would lose. And she suggested the law perhaps would change one day, but not in her working life. She concluded with this. 
Believe me, as a married mother of four, marriage is not all it's cracked up to be.